We've been gearing up for Aligned 17, which is a virtual conference dedicated to sales and marketing alignment. It's happening May 22nd through the 26th, and we wanted to do something special for B2B Growth listeners. Leading up to the event, we'll be giving you early access to some of the Aligned 17 sessions. Today's episode is exactly that. So if you like today's interview, head over to Aligned17.com and sign up to access every session of the event. We've got an incredible lineup of speakers, including Gary Vaynerchuk, Jill Conrath, Tony Hughes, Tucker Max, and Trish Bertuzzi, along with dozens of other B2B sales and marketing experts. So go to Aligned17.com and sign up today. You're listening to the B2B Growth Show, a podcast dedicated to helping B2B executives achieve explosive growth. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. I'm Jonathan Green. And I'm James Carberry. Let's get into the show. I'm Tim Sanders, author of the book Deal Storming, former CSO at Yahoo, and currently I lead Deeper Media. We're a research and consultancy firm. We work with sales and marketing leaders just like you on complex issues and problems. In my experience, the alignment between marketing and sales can make all the difference to your success. When I go back in my career annals and think about like the springboard to my success, I look at one particular deal that marketing really helped me not just win, but win the right way. I've always believed in collaboration. You have to ask yourself, who has a stake in the outcome? Who has some expertise about our problems? And that's exactly what happened in this situation. Paint the picture for you. It's 1998. I'm working for Mark Cuban, Broadcast.com, where the audio video streaming company, the one he sold to Yahoo a few years later. And I had just come back from Columbus where I had pitched Victoria's Secret and Limited's executive team on letting us webcast their annual fashion show for the first time ever. It hadn't been on TV yet. There'd never been a DVD. It was held every year in New York at Cipriani's. Victoria's Secret was rather late launching their website, and the big idea was we'll make a huge splash with a webcast like this. It'll set a world record for sure. So they were very interested, and they were also interested in the other idea, and that was they should buy a Super Bowl spot and run it three days before the webcast, which would be in early February, just to make sure that traffic sizzled. Well, anyway, I get back home. I present the idea to Mark, as well as my manager, Stan, and we developed a little collaboration meeting to work through it. You see, Mark was worried that not only would it crash our servers, the webcast very well would take down the internet. He didn't believe that the, the World Wide Web was mature enough to handle so many requests for video packets at the same time. As we had everybody around the table, we were just a small startup, um, our marketing lead, David, who was always involved early on in these type of situations, had an idea. He said, well, what's the value proposition, right? We're going to gather email addresses on their behalf from the signups and registration. That's what they're going to use after the event. And then I guess we're going to get them so like, exposure. If it's going to crash, why don't we show them what it's going to read like? In other words, his idea was to mock up Wall Street Journal and New York Times articles reporting that the Victoria's Secret webcast had too much traffic. It crashed. The Internet crashed. And it was a complete failure. And he posited that if I took those mock-ups back to Victoria's Secret prior to the signing of the contract, we would properly set their expectations so they would laser focus on the email capture and not whether or not the web could handle so much demand. So that's what I did. I go back to Columbus. I show them the mock-ups from our marketing guy. And the executives at Victoria's Secret smiled and said that would be a healthy problem. We would be honored to have such an in-demand brand and fashion show that it would break your servers and crack the internet. So we moved forward. They signed the contract. They ran the Super Bowl spot. And Mark was right. The whole thing crashed probably 10 minutes into the webcast. At first, we had problems on our servers. Then our providers like Level 3 and Quest couldn't provide enough traffic. AOL went down. And sure as shooting, within two weeks, Wall Street Journal and the New York Times ran articles saying it didn't work. So what happened? Well, I went back to Columbus and Victoria's Secret was fine with it. As a matter of fact, they thanked me as well as our team 
for setting their expectations so they could tell everybody else inside the organization. In fact, they renewed the contract. We did it the next year at the Can Ad Festival, figured out the technical issue with multicasting, and I've had a long relationship with those guys ever since. And what I've learned through the experience is that when you're selling something, there's a lot of complication. And sometimes it's about how you close it. And sometimes, like this case, it's how you deliver it and what the customer expects. And I don't think we would have done a good enough job without the help of marketing, which is my point today. We've got to make sure that we're putting marketing around the table. Whether you work at a little itty bitty startup, like when we were broadcast.com at the time, probably less than 150 people, or whether you're working at a big enterprise, sales and marketing is called sales and marketing for a reason. Collaboration can dramatically increase your bottom line. If you in sales invite in marketing as well as other disciplines early enough in the sales challenge, not only will it help you solve problems related to the deal faster, it'll probably improve your delivery and definitely improve your relationships across the company. MHI Global produced a study in 2014 where they declared that there is this type of organization, they call them the world-class sales organization. They produce, on the average, double-digit more than their nearest competitors. Whatever you want to measure, closing rates, annual revenue per market. And what they found is that the one thing all these world-class sales organizations had in common was the habit of conscious collaboration across departments in pursuit of big opportunities and big projects. It changed the culture of those organizations. And most importantly, it aligned two very connected functions, sales and marketing. In fact, the MHI study found that the world-class leaders were significantly more likely to have a strong level of alignment between marketing and sales throughout every part of the sales and marketing process. And that makes sense today because in many cases, many of you have told me that your marketing department is now in the lead gen business. They not only generate awareness, they're now actually generating funnel-based demand, giving you leads. I also find that in discussing this with marketing people from across the world, they tell me they could have more collaboration with the sales group because typically the only time they hear from sales is when the leads aren't working. I think we can do better than this. At Deeper Media in preparation for um, Dreamforce uh, last year, we did our own study. And what we found is that the difference between being a marketing partner and a marketing provider is dramatic to important KPIs. So we went out, and you'll see this in this slide. We asked companies, do you consider marketing a provider of services to sales or a partner with sales? In other words, is there some type of alignment It could be a structural alignment around uh, responsibilities or compensation. It could be a cultural alignment around process where marketing always involves sales on marketing research, voice of the customer. Sales always involves marketing. And the two have a regular communication channel. Not surprisingly, as you can see, most of the companies, when you talk to their CEO, CEO or CMO or CRO, they'll tell you, nope, marketing provides a service to us, but they run as an independent machine. Well, let me tell you something. The results are astounding for the partner-based organizations. Take a look at this. You can weed whack two months when marketing and sales are aligned. Why? Because marketing brings creativity. They bring effective voice. They bring a different set of constraints and greatest hits to the table. And whether you're early in the prospecting stage, in the middle at the convinced stage, or towards the end when you're trying to solve contract issues, marketing can be a powerful voice. Take a look at this next slide. Take a look here at the lift in closing ratio at companies, B2B, complex deals, when marketing is a partner versus when marketing is a provider. So obviously, there's a lot of strategic value in bringing sales and marketing together around big opportunities on either side of the table. The question is, how do you do it? I believe without a process, you get a mess. Over a decade ago, I started after I left Yahoo, consulting with companies about how to create such collaboration projects. I call it deal storming. And mostly what I focus on complex sales challenges, either at the singular strategic account level or a patch of accounts that all shared the same challenge or the same root cause issue. And what I did was I developed a seven-step process. It's the deal storming wheel. 
about how you bring together sales, marketing, and a variety of other disciplines and when. I want to talk a little bit about this process and talk to you about how you can align marketing throughout this process. The first stage of the game is to qualify. Even though you want to align yourself with marketing, treat them as your partner, please understand collaboration comes with a high cost. You're taking them off their day-to-day jobs and they're helping you or even vice versa if you're a marketing person considering creating a collaboration project. And so you have to qualify. You have to ask yourself, is this really strategic and Are we really stuck where our current process won't work? If you get past that qualify stage and you say yes, now the next thing you need to do is organize your team. I want you to think about it this way. Resource your team against the opportunity, but the first person you always pick should be someone from marketing. They have a really good understanding of the market. They have a creative mind. They're going to be very helpful to you at every step of the way. In fact, I've learned you can partner with the marketing person on your collaboration team where you and sales run the meetings, but marketing becomes the voice of the meeting. They're the person that is, so to speak, the scribe or the information master, and they send out reports after the meeting. And the reason they're great at this, in my experience, is because they have the talent and skill of distilling multiple voices multiple discipline voices into a singular document that everyone can understand that's not just going to be filled with sales speak, right? So that's important. Um, When you organize the team, you ask yourself two questions. Who has a stake in the outcome? Like who cares if we win or lose? Who cares how we play this game? And the second question you ask is, who has some expertise about our problem, like why we're stuck in this challenge. And when you build this team, as a general rule of thumb, invite one less person than you think you need. But, and I want to make a diversion here, it's really important that you have more perspectives around the table than just sales. Another piece of deeper media research went out and took a look um, at 186 situations where people went into a meeting to try and figure out the next play that they could all live with that actually would move things forward, whether it closed the deal or just solved one problem between the prospect deal and the done deal. You take a look at the research. The sales group, when they just add one more perspective, they increase by 50% their chance of walking out of the meeting with the next play. So when you bring marketing to the table, so to speak, you're already increasing your meeting chance by 50% of walking out of the room with the next play or a solution to the current challenge. I wanna add this though. The research found that when you add that third perspective, think sales plus marketing plus service delivery, now you increase by 100% your chance of walking out with the next play, but the magic number is four, just like the Beatles. Sales, marketing, services, operations or finance, or an external partner, or maybe someone from the channel, or maybe even a customer champion, that fourth perspective makes all the difference in the world, and here's why. Your perspective is a set of constraints, things that you think you can't do or you won't do, combined with a set of greatest hits. And every discipline has a different way of seeing the world. So we all have a different set of constraints and perspectives, but sometimes they're obsolete. And that's why increasing the diversity inside a collaboration meeting increases your chances of success. Okay, let's go back to the process. When you organize your team now, the most important thing you do is think about step three, prepare your team. And this is important if you want to bring out creativity. It's important to write a deal brief. In deal storming, I provide a template for this. If you'd like a template for that, just email me. I'm tim at deepermedia.com. The deal brief should be created at least two or three days before your collaboration meeting. It's going to highlight the opportunity, both on terms of revenue and strategic value. It's going to isolate the problem, why you think we're stuck in the current situation. You're going to indicate all the things that have been tried to date, how that's worked or not worked in front of the customer, and If you've got other information that might be food for thought, you can include that too. I love it when the brief also gives an individual thinking assignment to the person it's being sent to. So for example, when you write this brief, if you have someone from marketing, you might want to give them an assignment maybe um, to do a little bit of research on the market to see if there's something there that can bring a creative solution. You might want them to tell you, is there somebody missing from the team? But when you give people a thinking assignment in a brief like this, and you give them a few days to think about it, their mind will harness the power of incubation, and they'll begin to make connections and patterns, and they'll kind of realize things even before the meeting. And when they come to the meeting, they won't just 
just have more ideas, they'll have more clarity about the assumptions behind their ideas, so they won't be so defensive as you debate the idea, which you should in these meetings. The fourth step is to convene, to have a meeting. I want to give you a little trick here. So let's say you put together a 10 o'clock meeting to collaborate with your marketing partners and maybe a few other groups too around a big opportunity or maybe a specific sales challenge you got to solve. Schedule the meeting for 9.50 as a greeting time with the actual start time being 10. If you schedule a greeting time 10 minutes before the meeting, you have that 10 minutes where you're giving them donuts and coffee or whatever to scare up whoever's missing, and you might actually start on time. The way to think about the meeting is in really three steps. The first thing you've got to do is introduce each other and help each other understand why they're there and create a little bit of rapport. The second thing you want to do is have a a discussion about the problem, why you think you're stuck, and be willing to let people punch holes in it. In fact, sometimes this has made a big difference in changing your whole strategy. In deal storming, I talk about a situation um, where a advertising media sales team was stuck in a big opportunity with one of the major automakers. So they created a deal storm collaboration, and one of their participants was marketing. They're very aligned at this company with marketing, and they were trying to overcome the issue of like, how can we convince this automaker to increase their budget for this campaign by 250 because we're 250 more expensive than the people we're competing with. So that was a big part of the discussion. The marketing person who had a background in buying ads said, it's not about budget, it's about value. And as it turns out, she was absolutely correct. You see, the reason that this company was 250k more expensive is they were delivering rich media and their competitor was delivering flat banner ad display. What the marketing person explained in the meeting is that, and this is kind of early in this process of rich media, the automaker wasn't buying our internal numbers about the extra engagement and click-through for rich media. So she explained from her marketing research background, we need to get a third party, say like Nielsen, to actually document the real lift in performance and show it's not only worth the 250k, but maybe a multiple of that, and that is exactly what the winning play was. So sometimes sitting around the table, you first want to discuss the problem to make sure you're solving the right one. The other part of the actual meeting is the solution discussion. In this slide, I I illustrate it using the aperture of a camera lens. It really runs in three parts. So if you think you know the problem, then you start the solution discussion with an opening. Who has an idea? And when a person offers the idea, what they should do is say, this is the idea, this is why I think it's going to work, and here's my key assumption behind the idea. No time yet for debate. You want to get the ideas on the table, get everybody to participate. Ideas can come from anywhere. This is a key way of thinking when you're collaborating. The second phase of it is to narrow. You want to test the assumptions. You may eliminate some ideas right away because they're based on a faulty assumption, or it could just be something unproven like a gut feeling. If you really want to get good at running these collaboration meetings, learn to spot two okay ideas that can be combined into a great idea. In my experience, over $2 billion of collaborative deal flow, two out of three times, the big breakthrough idea is a combination of two ideas, usually across two different departments. So keep your eye open for that, and then have the group kind of rank things from hot to cold, and now you can narrow to the close. Look, you're not trying to reach consensus and all hold hands and sing jambala. It's never going to happen. You're going to walk out of that meeting without the next play. You're trying to find out what looks like the best next play that everyone in the room can live with. That's a big difference. Everyone in the room can live with. This is where you're going to get a few last minute amendments. What you're really trying to drive is an agreement that this is what we're going to do next and maybe even the agreement that everyone in the room is willing to do a little extra work to execute it quickly, which is the next step. Execute. If you have an idea, execute it and execute it in less than one week. I call that half a sprint. And you need to give very specific deadlines to everyone working with you on the project, but do it fast. The next step is to analyze. You're not just analyze whether you're leveling up in the sales process or whether you solve this problem. You have to analyze how the team chemistry is going. In certain situations, I found that maybe having the account executive running the deal storm isn't leading to the best results. And if we're going to come back to the table, I'm going to have my marketing partner do it instead or maybe a senior person in management. But analyze how the team is doing. And then finally, the last step is to report results. 
People don't have to be invited to the next meeting if you're making adjustments in the team. People don't expect to ride in the field with you as you execute these ideas in front of the customers, but they expect a common courtesy and decency that you will keep them in the loop and tell them what's going on. And for gosh sakes, if you and your team hatch an innovative idea that solves a sales or marketing problem, report it to senior management so it can be tested again and again and put into the new process quicker. You see, sometimes best practices take a sales conference or a year or two to actually be part of how we go to market so the reporting function is critical to success. That's it. That's the collaborative approach that you can take to dramatically increase your results, align yourself with marketing each and every day. I think it's important, though, that you understand that collaboration only works when there's a relationship. And you've got to develop relationships long before you need them. If I go back to my history and I think about other springboards, besides this event at Broadcast.com, there was a day early on in my Yahoo experience um, where I made a decision that really did change everything. Cuban had sold Broadcast.com to Yahoo. He wasn't going out with the acquisition. He was leaving. I moved out to the West Coast. And the first day I went into the cafeteria with my tray, I was about to sit with the rest of the sales guys who I'd met. And I looked around and all I saw were clicks. It was like a lunchroom scene out of the movie Clueless. I mean, the engineers were sitting together. The marketers were sitting together. The content guys were sitting together. And I made a decision that day that I would never eat with sales. In other words, I decided to use lunch and every other event-based opportunity to build new relationships with other departments. So I'd go over to the marketing group and I remember first buddying up with brand research and I'd set my tray down with with Judith and, and Anka and the gang and I'd introduce myself and I'd be quiet and I'd listen. And maybe I'd ask some questions about things they're working on that they're excited about or projects that they're trying to finish. And I just waited for opportunities to help. And when someone said, We're stuck in this particular situation. I need some help with a PowerPoint. I got to talk to this guy, Todd Teresi, over in finance. I was the favor guy. I realized that if I develop my own favor economy inside Yahoo and spread out and help people across the company from engineering to the product development group to business development to investor relations, I would create my own collaborative web. And I'm telling you, in my experience, it really came in handy. About six months after I landed at Yahoo, I was brought into a major, major account, Disney, and I was able to create an immediate collaboration team stitching together not only four perspectives, but every single stakeholder on this theatrical opportunity, and we took that account up to multi-million dollars, and that was because we had relationships, we had camaraderie, because I believe that the favor economy is fed by give and give and give. So here's my advice to you. Whether you're in sales or marketing, get out of your silo. And I don't mean just in terms of how you do your business, everything you do. At lunch, eat with different people. Whenever possible, meet and talk to different people. Steve Jobs loved the idea of designing the Apple facility to have these collisions, these casual conversations. And I want you to look for opportunities to help people. In my first book, Love is the Killer App, I talked about the idea that the best way to create success in your business life is to promote success in the business life of other people that you work with. So when you hang out with your new friends in other departments, like marketing, I want you to share knowledge. I want you to be generous. I want you to attempt to mentor if there's an opportunity to mentor. I want you to introduce them to people across the aisle too and create networking opportunities for them. But most of all, I want you to show them your compassion and empathy, to really care about their success, to really care about the struggles they're going through, especially if there's something that you can do to solve them. Because I believe that this is the greatest force in all business, this generosity, this love that we have for other people. Thank you very much. I'm Tim Sanders, and I can't wait to see the rest of the cats at Align 2017. If you've been getting value from this podcast, you can help us reach more people by reviewing the show on iTunes. Here's how you can leave a review in less than a minute. Open your podcast app and tap the search icon in the bottom right corner. Type in B2B growth, then select our show. Once you're there, tap the reviews tab and tell us what you think of the show. These reviews help us out a ton. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.